My brave lad, he sleeps in his faded coat of blue. In a lonely grave alone lies the heart that beats so true. They will find him and know him amongst the good and true. When a robe of white is given for that faded coat of blue. No more the blue. Welcome to War of the Rebellion, Stories of the Civil War. I am your host, Leon Meowser, and this is a reading of the regimental history under the Maltese Cross, Antietam to Appomattox, The Loyal Uprising in Western Pennsylvania, 1861-1865, Campaign's 155th Pennsylvania Regiment, narrated by the Rank and File. Episode 19, Chapter 9, Scenes and Incidents of the Battle of Gettysburg, and we're picking up in our last episode of this chapter at Confederate Prisoners. The large number of Confederate prisoners, many of whom were wounded, made it impossible for the ordinary provost guards of the Army of the Potomac to take charge of them after the Battle of Gettysburg, when the enemy left their dead and wounded within the Union lines. Therefore, details from regiments to serve as guards to the Confederate prisoners were assigned to convey them to the prisons provided for Confederate soldiers at Washington. Among those detailed for this duty were Privates Thomas E. Morgan and John K. Alter of Company E of the 155th, who reported to the Provost Marshal in the town of Gettysburg on July 6th for that duty, with 100 other guards from other regiments. After 10 days' service at that point, they, with over 2,500 prisoners, marched to York, Pennsylvania, in detachments, and from there by passenger trains. The prisoners with their guards were taken to Washington City, and their prisoners delivered to the Commandant of the Confederate prisons there. These Confederate prisoners seemed to enjoy their experience very much, getting abundance to eat and drink, and none seemed anxious to escape or to quarrel with their captors. On the morning of the 6th of July, the guards thus detailed from the various regiments witnessed a rather imposing sight in Gettysburg before going on duty to guard Confederate prisoners. This was the triumphal entry into the town of a New York State militia regiment numbering over 1,000 strong, with magnificent bands of music playing and national colors flying. They exhibited all the airs and bravado of great heroes engaged in the capture of a mighty city which had fallen only after a severe siege. The scene would have been more impressive on those veteran guards and other soldiers, and other soldier spectators present, who had participated in the battle just ended, had this dandy regiment fired a gun or been near any part of the battlefield during the Gettysburg campaign. The militia regiment, however, was put on provost guard duty in the town and vicinity and held possession of all the famous points during their stay in the neighborhood for nearly a month until they were disbanded. Before further describing the retreat of the Confederates, it is but proper to advert to the condition in which the close of the Battle of Gettysburg left the companies of the 155th Regiment. Not only the actual casualties, which are copied from the official records at the close of this chapter, but the general condition requires mention. As already stated in this narrative, the long and forced marching from Culpeper and United States Ford in Virginia to Gettysburg in pursuit of Lee's army, often in the most sultry heat that early summer produced, resulted in heavy losses in the ranks of the regiment from sunstroke, heat exhaustion, blistered feet, and general breakdown of many men in the ranks many more in the ranks sustained by greater strength and determination, at the end of this protracted forced marching to Gettysburg, rallied and went into action when physically, if insisted upon, they might have been excused by the surgeons because of their condition. Not a few of the dead bodies of the 155th and of Wheat's Brigade, who fell in that action in the storming of Little Round Top, had joined in the assault, were barefooted, being unable to wear shoes because of the condition of their feet. Among those, however, wholly unable to keep up until the last on these fatiguing marches, was Color Sergeant T.C. Lawson, who, by protest of the regimental surgeon, 
was compelled to leave the ranks and take to an ambulance because of his broken down and exhausted condition. Sergeant Milton Ziegler and Private Colin Lotta of Company E were sunstruck and dropped from the ranks on this march near Centerville. They were most excellent soldiers, but sustained such lasting injuries that they never returned to their company, and after years of suffering in civil life, died from the effects of the injuries received on this severe campaign. These names do not comprise all who were thus forced from the ranks on that march to Gettysburg. Among the regimental officers there were similar cases of suffering from the protracted marches and equal heroism displayed in persistently accompanying the regiment to the battlefield at Gettysburg. Captain S. A. McGee, commanding Company I, who had served in the Mexican War and on whom age was already beginning to tell, was sick and in the division hospital when the orders to march to Gettysburg were issued. With a soldier's instinct, he refused a sick leave tended him, tendered him by the surgeons, and in an ambulance, day after day, followed the devious marches of the regiment to the field of Gettysburg. The opening of the battle, however, caused him to leave the ambulance in the rear, and to join his command, and to take command of the company just as it was entering the salt on Little Round Top on July 2nd. In leading his company in this action, Captain McKee was among the first struck, receiving a painful wound. Colonel Allen Returns to Regiment Colonel Allen, leaving a sick bed in Pittsburgh, and against the advice of his physicians, determined to join the regiment wherever stationed. He found the regiment on picket duty at United States Ford on the Rappahannock. But preparing for the pursuit of the Confederate Army invading Pennsylvania, General George Sykes had succeeded to the command of the division instead of his friend General Humphreys, under whom Colonel Allen had served so gallantly at Fredericksburg. Colonel Allen's condition, after his arrival in camp, indicated that he was far from having recovered his health. He was entitled, by reason of seniority, to command the new brigade to which the 155th had been assigned, and which was then under command of Colonel P.H. O'Rourke of the 140th New York Volunteers. Colonel Allen, however, waived the rank question and requested to be command of his regiment. General Sykes, however, decided that this could not be done until a court of inquiry would have examined the sick leave granted Colonel Allen, and why the formality of renewing it had been overlooked. General Sykes declared that the Army regulations gave him no discretion to dispense with the necessary formality of a court of inquiry, but promised Colonel Allen to convene such a court at the earliest moment practicable. Before this court of inquiry could be convened, however, orders to march were issued, and the Maryland and Pennsylvania campaign began. Colonel Allen, being assigned an orderly at first, rode on the march on horseback, but the exposure to rains and damp grounds soon disabled him from continuing the campaign on horseback. Determining, however, to be with his regiment and take command in the approaching battle, with indomitable pluck and spirit, continued on the long and wearied marches, often by night as well as by day, in an ambulance until the Gettysburg battlefield was reached. He later found the regiment on Little Round Top on July 2nd and 3rd, sharing in the shelling and the protection of the friendly rocks of the celebrated ground with the men and officers of his regiment. His condition, however, became so much worse that his men cut him a pair of crutches to enable him to walk. General Sykes, while expressing admiration of the determined and soldierly instincts of Colonel Allen, declined to grant a renewal of the latter's request for restoration to the command of his regiment, announcing that under the Army regulations he was powerless to grant the request, more especially so as since the colonel had participated in the long march in battle, his disabilities had so increased as to incapacitate him for the command of the regiment. On July 5th, when the army had left Little Round Top and resumed the march in pursuit of the defeated Confederate army, Colonel Allen, being unable to follow, sought the protection of a farmhouse nearby. Lieutenant Colonel Kane, commanding the regiment, and all the officers and many of the men, paid Colonel Allen a farewell visit to his tent amid the rocks of Little Round Top and bade him a most affectionate adieu, 
as the Corps left the rocky summit to join in pursuit of Lee's army. Other changes and separations of officers, whose last appearance with the regiment was at Gettysburg, took place. Lieutenant E.A. Montuf, the highly popular adjutant of the regiment since its organization, soon after the Confederates crossed into Virginia, received an appointment from Governor Curtin in the office of Adjutant General of Pennsylvania. Adjutant Montuf rejoined the regiment and participated in the homeward march, the grand review at Washington of the Army of the Potomac, and the public reception of the regiment at Pittsburgh. First Lieutenant Joseph Torrance Power was detailed, after the Battle of Gettysburg, to the Treasury Department at Washington. Incidents of Death of Wyckoff and Welton Private William Welton of Company E, who was instantly killed in the Confederates' attack on Little Round Top on the afternoon of July 2nd, was shot in the throat. Immediately back of him, at about the same time, standing a little higher up on the hillside, was Sergeant Isaac Wyckoff, of the same company, who also was instantly killed by a mini-ball entering his forehead. As showing how little incidents produce unexpected results in the case of William Welton, his messmates, Private Chaz F. McKenna and James P. O'Neill, immediately after this, his fatal wound, took the contents of his pockets from his body, consisting of a prayer book and some letters to his affianced, with a view of sending the articles to his family. This action occurred in the middle of the battle, the comrades named not being allowed to leave the ranks long enough to take the body of their messmate to the rear. The stretcher bearers appeared and helped to place the body on the stretcher, and it was carried away to the rear. The messmates named, being obliged to resume loading and firing in the ranks, knew not to what point the body was carried by the stretcher bearers. This friendly action of Welton's messmates resulted in the loss at his burial in the rear of all data to indicate his name, rank, or regiment. So that Private Welton was buried in a grave marked Name Unknown. When the orders to cease firing had been issued, Sergeant Wyckoff's body was carried to the rear by orders of Lieutenant Powers, with whom Wyckoff had enlisted. Noah H. Pangburn and William S. Hindman of Elizabeth, Pennsylvania, Wyckoff's place of residence, looked after his burial and the due marking of his grave. A remarkable coincidence seemed to prevail on these forced marches in the fact that the extraordinarily tall soldiers in the ranks were often the first to break down, exhausted with the severity of the 30-mile daily journeys. Lieutenant Porter D. Marshall of Company K, 6 feet 9 inches in height, conceded to be the tallest soldier in the army, who had sustained all the hardships of all the previous campaigns, succumbed to the fatigues and dropped out of the ranks, excused from all duty, on June 30th, being conveyed to a hospital. He was a brave soldier, never before missing in action. Sergeant Thomas C. Lawson of Company H was also over six feet tall, who had won great distinction with the colors of Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville, was ordered from the ranks on the same day with Lieutenant Marshall for physical disability resulting from the protracted marches and was reluctantly compelled to turn the colors over temporarily to Corporal Matthew Bennett. Lieutenant Marshall, the regimental giant, and Sergeant Lawson soon recuperated and returned to duty in the respective companies present in every battle from Gettysburg to Appomattox, it being also notable that notwithstanding their extraordinary size, both escaped the missiles of the enemy during their entire term of service. Captain James B. Palmer, quartermaster of the 155th, although by his office not required to participate in battle, was accepted by General Stephen H. Weed as a volunteer aide-de-camp on his staff on the morning of July 2nd, 1863, and was serving with the general on Little Round Top, where the Confederate sharpshooter from Devil's Den mortally wounded that officer. Captain Palmer continued his service with General Garrett, the successor of General Weed, during the remainder of the battle. The Casualties at Gettysburg 
Corporal Matthew Bennett of Company I, was detailed by Colonel Kane a day or two before the Battle of Gettysburg to take charge temporarily of the colors during the absence of Color Sergeant Thomas C. Lawson, who was for the time being incapacitated for active duty by the severe marching, and Sergeant Bennett performed his duty with credit to himself. Color Corporal John H. Mackin of Company F was wounded in the shoulder on ascending Little Round Top, but despite the severity of the wound, remained to the end of the battle. When, unable to resume the march, he reported to the hospital, his wound being much aggravated by his neglect to secure early medical treatment. Color Corporal Thomas J. Tomer of Company E, who had a surgeon's pass in his pocket enabling him to straggle free from interference from the provost guards because of his fatigued and exhausted condition from forced marches, entered the battle with the colors, and was stricken down at the first fire of the enemy on Little Round Top, being so badly wounded that he was never able to resume duty in the field, and causing him to be a sufferer for life. Also mortally wounded at Gettysburg, in the attack of the Texan Brigade on the position of the 155th, was Corporal David M. Smith of Company B. He was wounded in the left groin and was carried back a short time after the attack, but died just as he reached the foot of Little Round Top. Private William Douglas of Company B about the same time was struck in the center of the forehead and with a piercing shriek fell back dead. In the very advance of his company, Corporal Henry F. Weaver of Company B, one of the youngest boys in the regiment, was wounded in the ball of the right ankle joint necessitating immediate amputation at the field hospital at a time when, as in a letter he describes it, the balls kept coming as numerous apparently as drops of rain in a heavy shower. As his father states, he lay there, expecting to get another bullet in the head at any minute. Company K had four men wounded and one killed, Lieutenant Foster and Privates Shields, Hetrick, and David Kirkpatrick, the last named being struck by a ball, but not disabled. Private John Cowan was shot through the bowels and killed. The regiment had no chaplain at Gettysburg. Field Hospital A matter requiring acknowledgement here was the efficiency and zeal of the regimental surgeons, Dr. J.A.E. Reed and Dr. W. Stockton Wilson, assistant surgeon, and Ellis C. Thorne, hospital steward, in the Gettysburg campaign. These officers were indefatigable in their attentions and efforts to relieve the sufferings on the march and in camp, and to the great increase of their duties precipitated by the three days' battles of Gettysburg. The emergency field hospitals at the rear of Little Round Top were opened immediately on the attack by the enemy on that stronghold, and necessarily the field hospitals had to be located as close as possible to where the injured fell. A nearby woods, in a position supposed to be somewhat sheltered, was hastily selected by the surgeons as a site for the field hospitals, which were located in many instances within four or five hundred yards back of the position occupied by the regiments and batteries in front. The 5th Corps and Sykes Division Field Hospital were not far from General Meade's headquarters during the battle. Corporal Weaver, Color Corporal Tomer of Company E, and others who were carried back to these field hospitals described the scenes of the accumulated thousands of wounded deposited by the stretcher bearers on the grounds awaiting their turn for treatment or the amputation table during the afternoon of the 2nd and 3rd of July as something terrific in its impressions the enemy's bombardment and shelling reached the woods and rocks near these field hospitals, and the surgeons at their posts zealously discharging their duties, and in many cases, whilst performing amputation operations on the table, were exposed to as deadly a fire from the enemy as were those in the front on the firing line, yet they did not desist or prove recreant to their duties. Volunteer Surgeons and Nurses Reach Battlefield Before the sounds of battle at Gettysburg had ceased, delegations of good people, principally physicians and Christian Commission members, 
reached the front and tendered their much-needed services to the already overworked surgeons, nurses, and hospital stewards. Philadelphia and Pittsburgh surgeons arrived in considerable numbers, bringing with them supplies of medicines, instruments, lint, and other needed articles. The men of the 155th Regiment were gladdened by the visits of esteemed and skilled surgeons from Pittsburgh, with home messages, and were especially delighted to witness their prompt devotion to their professional duties. Of the many patriotic surgeons so promptly on the battlefield, tendering their services, are recalled Dr. Thomas W. Shaw, Dr. Thomas J. Gallagher, Dr. John Dixon, Dr. Joseph Dixon, and Dr. George L. McCook, and others not now recalled. Abundance of supplies for the wounded and sick followed the departure of the delegation of surgeons for the battlefield, being provided by the Christian Commission. No corps of surgeons labored more devotedly in the field hospitals on the battlefield and in the town of Gettysburg than did the patriotic members of the Pittsburgh delegation, and too much praise cannot be awarded the noble deeds and acts of the surgeons named. All have long since passed away to their eternal reward. Nor was the patriotic devotion of the profession confined alone to those who so promptly rallied to the relief of the wounded and sick after each battle. Dr. Albert G. Walter, a surgeon of national reputation, conducted a hospital in Pittsburgh during the Civil War and gave to soldiers his unremitting attention and highest skill. Dr. George McCook, Sr., also an eminent surgeon of Pittsburgh, gave freely of his skill and services to the Union soldiers, his advanced age alone preventing his taking the field of active service with his numerous kinsmen, the Fighting McCooks of Ohio. The late Dr. James McCann, who attained the highest rank in the surgical profession in Pennsylvania, imbibed the patriotic spirit of his preceptors, Drs. John, Joseph, and Thomas Dixon of Pittsburgh, and immediately upon graduating at University of Pennsylvania, volunteered as assistant surgeon of the 5th Regiment of Pennsylvania Volunteers and served until the close of the war. In the field hospital at Antietam, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, and Gettysburg, and in Grant's Virginia campaigns, the young surgeon was unremitting in his devotion to the wounded. Dr. Edward J. Donnelly, surgeon of 9th Pennsylvania Reserves of Pittsburgh, served in all the campaigns of the Army of the Potomac, and at his post of duty on the battlefield relieving the badly wounded, he was captured and taken prisoner by the enemy several times, declining to abandon the wounded. Official Report, Gettysburg Report of Colonel Kenner Garrod, 146th Regiment, New York Infantry, Commanding 3rd Brigade Headquarters, 3rd Brigade, 2nd Division, 5th Army Corps. Camp near Berlin, Maryland, July 16, 1863. Sir, I have the honor to make the following report of the part taken by the 3rd Brigade in the late battle near Gettysburg. On the second instant, after changing position several times in the early part of the morning, the brigade with the division remained idle lying by their arms until about 4 p.m. At this time, the brigade was moving rapidly forward, most of the time at the double quick, nearly one and one-half miles, when it came under the fire of the enemy's musketry. At this point, the leading regiment, under the direction of General Warren, Chief Engineer Army of the Potomac, was led to the left up on what is known as Round Top Ridge, Hazlitt's battery ascended the ridge immediately to the rear of this regiment, the 140th New York Volunteers, Colonel P. H. O'Rourke commanding, and went into battery on the summit. The 140th was formed in line and was immediately closely engaged with the enemy at short musket range on the left slope of the ridge. A portion of the 1st Division, 5th Army Corps, was engaged to the left of the ridge and this regiment and Hazlitt's battery were brought up to assist the 1st Division in repelling a heavy assault of the enemy, with the evident design of gaining this ridge. 
Colonel O'Rourke, was mortally wounded at the head of his regiment while leading it into action. The other regiments, 146 New York Volunteers, and the 91st and 155th Pennsylvania Volunteers, were led to the right and front some distance and formed in a line in a narrow valley to support a portion of the 3rd Corps and Watson's battery, then severely pressed by the enemy. Before becoming engaged, however, orders received for these regiments to return at the double quick to Round Top Ridge and secure and hold that position. The 91st was posted on the left of the battery, connecting with the 140th. The 146th and the 155th were posted on the right, extending from the battery on the summit along the crest of the ridge to the gorge on the right. As soon as the regiments had their positions, men from each regiment were advanced down the slope to the front and among the rocks, and together with those in line on the crest, actively engaged the enemy during the rest of the day. At night, this ridge, naturally strong, was strengthened by building a stone wall about halfway down the slope, wherever the rocks offered no protection to the men. The next day, the brigade remained in the same position, and though, under the shells of the enemy and exposed to their sharpshooters, it was not engaged to any extent. When the brigade and Hazlitt's battery seized this ridge, it was done under a heavy musketry fire and was entirely unoccupied, excepting by a part of the 1st Division on the extreme left, and I am gratified to report to the general commanding the division that the order to secure and hold this ridge was faithfully executed. At no time, during July 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, after its position was assigned it, did any regiment of the brigade leave its place excepting, at the time of the heavy assault, a portion of some of the regiments advanced to the front down the slope of the ridge in order to have a better fire at the enemy. A few moments after General Weed, the brigade commander, had placed his command in position on this ridge, he was mortally wounded on the summit near the battery. Lieutenant Hazlitt, commanding the battery, while offering his assistance to General Weed, fell mortally wounded. I am pleased to report that all of the regiments performed their duty well, and that during the two days' battle, the officers and the men conducted themselves in the most praiseworthy manner. A report of the casualties has already been furnished. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, K. Garrod. Colonel, 146 New York Volunteers, Commanding Brigade. George Ryan, Captain and AAAG, 2nd Division, 5th Army Corps. George Ryan, Captain, and AAAG, 2nd Division, 5th Army Corps. Simultaneous with the advance of Wheat's Brigade, with the 155th Pennsylvania Volunteers storming of Little Round Top on July 2nd, under direction of General Warren, the 83rd Regiment Pennsylvania Volunteers, led by Colonel Strong Vincent, was storming the opposite side of the mount, and met with fierce resistance from Confederate sharpshooters, and a hand-to-hand -hand encounter during which the brave Colonel Vincent fell, mortally wounded. He survived, however, long enough to receive direct promotion to a Brigadier General's rank by telegraphic order of President Lincoln. Pennsylvania has erected a magnificent monument on Round Top to his memory, and that of the comrades of the 83rd who also fell in the battle. Colonel Vincent, as brigade commander, spoke his last words in action to Colonel Joshua L. Chamberlain of the 20th Maine Volunteers, who assumed command of the brigade on the fall of Vincent early in the battle. The heavy volleys of O'Rourke's regiment, 140th New York, in the advance of Wheat's brigade on the summit of the ridge was heard by Chamberlain. As his men engaged in a hand-to-hand -hand conflict with the Texan troops of Longstreet's Corps on the left slope of Little Round Top, it ended by Chamberlain's at the head of the 20th Maine, leading a successful bayonet charge against the Confederate column which was seeking to pass through the gap between Little and Big Round Top Mountains, and thereby outflanked the Union position. The losses of Weed's and Vincent's brigades were unusually heavy in this action, the destructive aim of the enemy sharpshooters adding to the number of casualties. The late Lieutenant Arthur W. Bell of the 155th Regiment, who was in charge of the Ambulance Corps of Wheat's Brigade, 
states in his report that between 4 p.m. of July 2nd and 2 a.m. of the 3rd, the stretcher bearers removed from the rocks and fields of the positions occupied by the brigades of Weed and Vincent over 1,300 wounded. Retreat of Enemy Discovered The picket firing continued all day of the 4th between the two armies. Reconnoitering parties of the United States Regular Cavalry had been sent out by General Meade at intervals during all day of the 4th, and at dark the officers in charge reported to General Meade that the enemy still occupied all their works and picket lines with no evidence of their abandoning any portion of the same. Before daylight of the 5th, Meade and all his staff were awake and alert for action. General Warren, accompanied by Captain E.B. Cope, ADC, was dispatched to make observations of the enemy's movements from Little Round Top as soon as daylight would allow a view. There, surrounded by the men of Wheat's Brigade still fast asleep in their water-soaked blankets, Warren, with his powerful field glasses, made important observations which caused him, for confirmation, to ride to the advanced picket lines of Wright's division of the Sixth Corps. This division then occupied the Peach Orchard, the scene of the great fight of the Third Corps on July 2nd. Warren then made a personal reconnaissance across the picket line and out along the Emmitsburg Road and found all the positions of the enemy deserted, and that Lee's entire army and trains had, under cover of darkness and of the heavy rains, retreated during the night. Warren, on this discovery, rejoined Captain Cope on Little Round Top and at once, representing Meade, delivered to General Sedgwick orders to have the Sixth Corps, then in reserve, immediately to march in pursuit of the retreating Confederate army. On Warren's reporting the retreat of Lee's army, General Meade dispatched his cavalry in pursuit. Chapter 10 Retreat of the Confederate Army which we will pick up next week. Of course, I've written my usual amount of small notes. There's actually 32 minutes of recorded time, but I didn't actually write down a lot of notes, but I'm going to include some, some places for you to visit, check out. Heat cases, dying or falling out from heat is still common in the military. I met a guy who had died and survived after being resuscitated out in the field, and an, another who had a stroke on a hike, or a march, I should say, and had to be evac Got to drink your water, man. The answer is, drink your water. Of course, back then, they only had their canteens. Now we've got water pur purification tablets, and every soldier... A marine probably carries at least three liters on him, at the least now, when going out on marches or hikes. Uh, moving on from that, uh, Colonel Allen, following his regiment, like is the Terminator, had me elated that his boys had such a great colonel, because it's hard to find good officers, but man... The way to take care of your regiment is obviously to get better first and then meet back with them. So I felt bad for him, like, for that. But as soon as I was, like, reading, I was like, man, you got to stay home and get better and then rejoin your boys. Uh, and then I also noted down Adjutant Montooth leaving for Pennsylvania and how everyone liked him. It is so bad when good officers leave and get reassigned or move off or do whatever because... There's not a whole lot that's predictable in the infantry. Marching and terrible food. And one of the things that you have to deal with is, is your officer smart enough to lead your unit? And really popular officers are very rare. I also was not, I guess, sure that they were going to do, this is how this person died, and this is how this person died. But I do prefer it. It lets me know the exact type of sacrifice that these men made and where they died or how they were wounded. I, re I really appreciate that from the authors. Moving on, let's talk about two things that were at the very end of this chapter. Doctors getting shelled by artillery rounds. Sounds like a real bad time. 
especially since the wounded were kind of just laying around and probably not able to move out of the way. I'm going to link a YouTube channel. It's to the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. I think a lot of my listeners who listen to this are going to be pretty interested in this YouTube channel. It's pretty nice. For the final thing to talk about, of course, a Fighting McCook family member shows up in this regimental history. How could they not? This regimental history's got a little bit of everything, apparently, and the Fighting McCooks were everywhere, so I'll include a Wikipedia link to them on my website. Of course, you can read about them anywhere. They're very famous. They have their own statues and plaques, I think. The Fighting McCooks were two brothers who had a ton of children, <laughs> and they just were everywhere in the Union Army. It's um, some of them die. Um, those that survive kind of go on to, I think most of them anyway, go on to prominence kind of deal. Interesting story. You've got, you'll like it. If, if you want to delve into it, you can. All right. But with that, uh, I'm going to get out of here. I'll see you guys in the next episode. <laughs> Bye-bye. They will find him and know him. Amongst the good and true When a robe of white is given for That faded coat of blue No more the bugle Called the weary one Rest, noble spirit In thy grave alone They will find you and know you Amongst the good and true when a robe of white is given for that faded coat of blue, he cried, "Give me water and just one little crumb, and my mother she will bless you through all the years to come." Go tell my sweet sister, so gentle, good and true, that I'll meet her up in heaven on. My faded coat of blue No more the bugle Calls the weary one Rest, noble spirit In thy grave alone They will find you and know you Amongst the good and true When a robe of white is given for That faded